Our last session is our final keynote presented by Sean Prue. One of the most versatile talents in media and entertainment today, Sean Prue has credits as a television host, documentary producer, talk radio host, motivational speaker, columnist, author, publisher, actor, live event host, spokesperson, and activist for the issues of mental health, animal rights, and HIV stigma. He is the podcast and communications officer with Realize Canada, writing, producing, and hosting the Realize podcast, nurturing potential, inclusion, and belonging, the podcast dedicated to exploring the strength, adapt adaptability, and determination of individuals facing the ever-changing landscape of episodic disabilities. That is such a long bio. <laughs> <laughs> Who wrote that? <laughs> hey, everyone, and thanks for inviting me to speak at the fourth National Summit on Episodic Disabilities and Employment, Moving Knowledge to Action. As it wraps up, it's an honor to have been asked. I hope you've had a wonderful conference, and I want to just say congratulations to everyone at Realize Canada involved in making it happen, working uh, tirelessly with such a great turnout uh, as well. Before I start, I want to recognize that as a cis white male, I've led a life of privilege, others have not, and that this has informed and advantaged the experiences of my life you're about to hear more of. Do the best you can until you know better, then when you know better, do better. That is one of my favorite empowering quotes from the late great Maya Angelou. And as I've gone about my life, I've tried hard to adhere to that wisdom. Move your knowledge into action, she was telling us. I want to share the story of my episodic disability with you today in support of that idea, one that has informed this summit and provided so many learnings over the last two days. Because it's one thing to have knowledge, but how many of you will take it back to where you work and put it into action? For those of you who don't know me, alongside producing the and hosting the new Realize podcast, I host a weekend talk show, The Sean Prue Show, heard across North America each week on Sirius XM Canada Talks now in its 11th season where we've had everyone from Oprah to Lady Gaga guest. I also published the Gay Guide Network, Canada's first queer digital magazine founded in 2022, 2002 rather. Uh, I've written for many of the major national newspapers, including a modern spirituality column that ran for several years in one of the majors. I love Sean, my dog. this is Tammy. Yes. Can you yep. slow down for the interpreters? Oh, I'm Thank so sorry. So I know I'm a fast Thank talker. You. Okay, I'll slow it down. Um, I love my dog. I'll say that twice because it's worth saying. I also failed grade 10 math and I'm a high school dropout with no post-secondary education or training in any of these lanes I work in and once had a successful career making six figures before I was 30 working in finance telling people what the numbers meant even though as I said failed grade 10 math. I've talked a lot about my experience in the corporate world before and I'll share more today as it relates to my episodic disability. In 2000, I took a leap of faith and abandoned the money and the new house I just bought to go broke and reinvent myself to follow my creative ambitions. I realized I'd done well in a lane I wasn't good at, numbers, and asked myself what would happen if I put the same drive and energy in committing into a lane that I'd always excelled at, words. And I figured that if I had been given so much myself to other different investment houses, that I stood a chance of succeeding if I gave an equal amount of myself to working for myself. So I became a creative entrepreneur, building a name for myself using my given talents, working eventually in print media, TV, and radio. I've talked a lot about being an entrepreneur before, and, and I'll do so to, today as it relates to my episodic disability. But the one thing I haven't really talked a lot about until today, in fact, kept it private for almost a decade until it began to bear the weight of a secret, is my episodic disability. I've really never talked about it at length and, and gone into it in any kind of detail. I'm HIV positive, undetectable. And if I can sidebar for a second and take advantage of a captive audience right now for an educational moment, undetectable simply means the HIV virus can no longer be detected via standard tests. And blessedly, it also means HIV cannot be transmitted sexually. After decades of agonizing loss and people fighting to find some kind of hope, a miracle came and we did a really, really poor job celebrating that. A terrible job telling the world about it. 
I know gay men today often don't even know what undetectable means. And so whenever I can, I like to make sure that people who may not know what undetectable means or that it's even a thing do know. Thank you for indulging my public service announcement. I've been writing about my relationship and my journey with HIV that began when I was 17 in a memoir called Cracked, which my lovely agent is shopping around. Uh, since I've written about my early beginnings already for a manuscript, I thought there was a little point in rewriting it for this talk and decided to just share some of the passages from Cracked, which I've edited and condensed. There's some adult content, nothing X-rated, but if you happen to have little ones around you in the room, you don't want to hear, have hear about adult situations, now might be a good time to get them to change rooms. I acquired HIV through sex. The first time I experienced sex was with two men at once, the autumn my, after my father died one hot July morning. I had just turned 17. I guess I've always been greedy. We, me and the quiet closeted couple in their mid thirties didn't use condoms to take my virginity, even though it was the 1980s and the AIDS pandemic was rapidly ending millions of lives. It was a surreal time, even from my solitary and removed vantage point. The small town I, my mother, and my two little brothers lived outside of was 70 miles outside Toronto, where homosexual men, like in all major North American cities, were dropping like flies. Under the specter of AIDS at its most horrifying and ravaging worst, gay rights were on a fast rise, along with the ascent of norm-disrupting in-your-face stars like Boy George, Michael Jackson, Prince of Madonna. Women were holding steadfast to a term from the 70s, Ms. The Space Challenge Shuttle Challenger had exploded mid-launch, and the Iran-Iraq War was President Reagan's most pressing concern, not a war on AIDS. Even though AIDS protesters demanded that the superpower American government, government take action, they didn't. And it would take the ex-actor turned global leader eight long years before he would even publicly say the acronym for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Two enormously famous AIDS-related deaths shook the zeitgeist. Gay people and their allies were fueled to increased anger and outrage and action. Beloved, beautiful Hollywood movie icon, Rock Hudson, who had to quit playing Linda Evans' love interest in on the number one rated dynasty when his health began failing fast before the eyes of millions of viewers, died in his home in Beverly Hills in 1985 after several much, much watched, scrutinized, and failed attempts to find cures at a clinic in Paris. Nancy Reagan, American's first lady and Hudson's old friend from their movie star days, cruelly ignored his phone calls asking for her help. His long hidden homosexuality became public knowledge after his death. And Ryan White was the American child who became infected It's something else to go back. We've got you, Sean. We're here with you. The American child who became infected with the HIV virus through contaminated blood used to treat his hemophilia. White was expelled from middle school in Kokomo, Indiana, after his infection became public. Even only six months, the boy surprised everyone by living for five years instead, dying a month before graduating high school. As I inched closer to the end of my own high school experience in a different country altogether, a gay teen still far away from coming out of the closet, living in the middle of 150 acres of apple and maple fields and reeds and fields of ragweed and corn and cows grazing. I never knew the last knew everything about Rock and Ryan in the USA, well before the advent of social media, horror stories of this murdering sex sickness had nonetheless gone viral. But that didn't mean I knew how to ask for a condom that autumn night or what a rubber even looked like. And so appeased the anxiety niggling at me as my first real sexual experience unfolded by foolishly telling myself that these two men were older than me, 
nearly twice my age and were not using protection, so it had to be because they were not sick. A safer sex did not flash bright on my radar the way maintaining a sex elegance the first time I, my first time at that did. I was nervous at hell, albeit titillated and thrilled and deliciously overwhelmed. Losing my virginity felt like something that always needed to happen and so right when it did. But the following morning, any positive af afterglow disintegrated as I rode the, the bus to school. My maiden sexual voyage brought with it a dire discovery of mandatory initiation into a new fraternity to which other gay men across the globe already belonged, although surely all wanted out of. A club where everyone paid an enormous, an enormous membership fee of the form of just one thought on repeat, a malicious mantra. Was I infected? As the bus full of sleepy teens who when fully awake would terrorize me nine hours from now on the way home, pulled into the driveway of my high school along with 300 other kids bust in from all parts of the county, I was cognizant of only one of only three things. I felt officially gay, very alone. And this was all accompanied by a chorus of, am I going to be okay? How long have I got? How could I tell my mother? I would be the next one in my family dead. I was positive. After my threesome, I bore, I bore steadily down on the nonstop intensifying fright rising deep with, from within me. My pushback was futile. Mocking me, it was an inky swirly terror that rose and swelled, filling my being. I was haunted by what I had done that night. Not the threesome, which played in my memory, Lane claimed to me forcefully it was the constant grim reminder. It was the aftermath of that wonderful night, the lack of condoms and the desire and the dire consequences I knew I'd set into motion, set a ton ravel in due time. I had no idea what to do in this situation. I was too scared to speak. The two guys had just asked them about their health. What if I didn't like their answer? I decided to wait until I got sick before getting confirmation of what I was sure I already knew anyway. I hadn't even processed that my dad was dead. <laughs> my apologies. I needed time to let AIDS sink in too. It took up so much of the real estate in my head. I needed to give my younger brothers and my mother time to get over dad's death before I had to face mine. <sighs> but mostly I had to terminate at whatever cost, my family spinning like whirling dervishes from crisis to crisis. There had to be some reprieve for us, however fake. I decided to use up what time I had until I got sick, save up as much money as possible to leave behind for my mom and brothers the way my father had, hadn't been able to. I wasn't trying to be my father's understudy, but by being so flagrantly irresponsible that night with those two men, I had to let my mother and my brothers down. I had let my mother and my brothers down in the worst way imaginable. I needed to make up for that however I could until AIDS made me sick. At the midpoint of that raw winter that followed, I got sick with AIDS. I grew so ill that to make it 20 feet from bedroom to the bathroom in the morning, past the closed door of dad's old office, I clung to the walls to brace my shaky lumber. Once in the shower many mornings, I collapsed down into the tub. I was so anemic. I fought obstinately with everything I had, masking my spiraling health from my family in every way I could think to, as my father had hidden his. Are you okay? My favorite teacher asked me after the classroom had emptied out into noisy hallways, the peal of the school bell tapering away. I had fallen asleep atop my desk and just come to. She gave me no grief, knew something had to be the matter. Is everything okay, Sean? No, it's not. I have AIDS, I wanted to tell her. When I could no longer get out of bed, my mother, aghast, dragged me into town on a day off from her new job to get me medical attention. I kept drifting in and out of consciousness, pulling myself back up and out. 
I sat alone with Dr. Mulder, full of frozen in my seat. Our lives were about to be blown apart even more now. As I was examined, the whole of me echoed one command, ask for an AIDS test, ask for an AIDS test, ask for an AIDS test. How I wish I'd known then what would take me years to know and understand and now practice religiously. Trust your inner voice. But I was too young and too afraid and had not been formally introduced to the one thing I could always have faith in, my gut knowing. I definitely did not trust my doctor or his office staff not to gossip that the tall, gay, pimply kid with the Duran Duran hair who hated hockey, wore purple and shoulder pads, whose drunk dad had just died, was going to die next of that gay disease, AIDS. Twist, mononucleosis was the sweetest word I'd ever heard from anyone's lips when it left my doctor's mouth. I had the kissing disease, not the dying disease, not AIDS. I was exhausted, that was all. I couldn't be certain 100% that I didn't have AIDS, but at least this diagnosis wasn't that. You can't find something unless you look for it. And I, a cowardly lion, ignored my instincts, covered my eyes, taking what was behind door number two instead. I followed my doctor's orders and got a lot of rest. I got better to my great relief for a while. And so began my long torrid relationship with AIDS. When I moved to the city and I was sexually active, it led me to scouring the pages of Extra Magazine out every other Thursday and included inside it a proud live section, which I would scour to see if I knew anyone who had just died, if I'd had anything, any, uh, if I'd been intimate with them. And sometimes there they were, faces of men I'd slept with. I tried always to use condoms, but like all of us, I'm not perfect. Sometimes the condom broke. Once a guy selfishly removed his without telling me. Sometimes I was in love. Sometimes I was celebrating or upset. Sometimes I wasn't sober. Sometimes my self-esteem was low and I didn't want to say no to the guy I thought was way hotter than me who wanted to have sex. Sometimes, like countless gay men around the world, I was just so damn tired of condoms. At dinner parties with other gay peers, guys would announce their HIV status, negative status from having just been tested, and we'd all cheers it. Sometimes I would announce mine and would clink glasses, but it would be folly because I lied just to keep up. Fear had squatted inside me and took up an enormous amount of real estate in my young mind. I never got tested. I was so afraid. My doctor would ask me every time I saw him and every time I would refuse. There weren't the kinds of meds, cocktails there are now in this age of miracles of being undetectable. People were still dying and dying all around me. I just didn't have the strength, mentally or emotionally, to deal with a positive diagnosis. Instead, I spent years looking at any mark I ever got on my body, worrying if I'd had unprotected sex watching other friends die. I remember Don. One weekend we were dancing at Chaps on a Friday night. The next weekend he was gone. This vicious cycle of denial, lying to myself, fear, rage, trauma, all part of my experiences on the daily and not just me, on the part of gay men everywhere. Compounding this were the experiences to be had as I worked in the corporate world and finance where I was fast tracking it. You have to remember, this was a time that would have been around the 1990s, straight cis white male club. There were no LGBTQ plus alliances within investment houses and banks. Anyone gay was deeply closeted. I never met another gay person my whole eight years in finance. I remember seeking permission to run an ad and extra to attract clients, gay clients, an untapped market, and was laughed out of meeting and told we were doing just fine without faggots and dykes becoming clients here. Today, of course, the community is heavily courted. Banks wrap their buildings in rainbows of pride, some all year long. Once I got sick, and I don't remember with what, with what, but I was off and in bed for three weeks. When I returned to work, one of my colleagues came up to my cubicle and asked me loudly in front of everyone, so are you sick with AIDS? She, su she suggested it in an entitled way, like she had a right to know the answer to it, and in a manner 
that said that if I did have AIDS, it was not something she would allow to have happen in the office. After I got my last role in finance, I was there for about eight years as a reminder. I learned that my boss, who had been looking to fill the job for months, went to the president of the company and said to him, I think I found the person I want to hire, but I think he might be gay, and I want your assurance that he won't get hassled here. He was given a province, but neither of them had real control over people if they wanted to hassle me. I arrived one morning on my desk to see a paper on my keyboard. I turned it over and it said one word in bold letters, AIDS. I threw it out and tried not to let it bother me. There was no point in going to HR either. The culture back then would have made it so that protections for a gay person were non-existent. I'm unsure of what kind of toll incidents like these happening regularly took on my mental health. It definitely added to my feeling of being alone, of trying to hide my identity, having to lie, make up stories, substitute guys' name with girls' names whenever I, whenever I told these stories. I wasn't understood. I wasn't valued the same way my peers were. I didn't fit in and I didn't belong. I outran the AIDS monster that was always at my heels until 2005. It was 1985 when I had sex with those two guys, two decades of running. But in 2005, I got sick. I got really, really sick. And I knew I had to finally face my greatest nightmare and get tested. And of course, my tests came back positive. <laughs> my doctor, bless him, booked off two hours the afternoon. I got my diagnosis to be with me. He, of all people, knew how terrified I was of becoming HIV and was prepared to deal with a hot glue gun mess he rightfully expected me to be. But I was at peace with the diagnosis. It shocked the hell out of him. I wasn't a sobbing, petrified, out of control disaster. I was fine. It was easier, of course, to be fine because by 2005, modern medicine had created medication that kept the virus at bay. I was very blessed. But when you've been running for two decades from your worst fear for 20 years and you lose and it catches you, you get to look it in the eye. And when I did, it lost its power over me. The worst thing that could have happened to me happened to me and I was still standing. I really surprised myself that day. Out in the world was a different story. HIV and AIDS still carry so much stigma. We self-stigmatize. We, we accept stigma from others. This is a true story. A friend just this past Sunday afternoon told me about his friend who was diagnosed HIV positive last week. And his roommate, when he learned of this, kicked him out of the apartment. That breaks my heart. Despite how far we've come, how far we've come scientifically, and that AIDS is no longer a death sentence for most, to be tested to be positive is still a traumatic experience for many. So this poor guy is coping with that, wrapping his head around it all, and finds himself unhoused. When I got my diagnosis, my writing career was just taking off. I was making a name for myself, and I was eyeballing other media opportunities. And I didn't want to be known as the HIV positive blank, so I kept it private. I didn't turn to my mother or my brothers for support. I told very few friends just other HIV positive ones sometimes, and always people I had sex with. Like many episodic disabilities, HIV can be a burden you deal with alone. I remember the first time I took HIV meds. I don't think I'd ever felt as sick before as I did then. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, a splitting headache, loss of appetite, I couldn't get out of bed. It was the longest 10 days of my life as my body adjusted to the powerful meds I was taking. By then I was working for myself and I lost 10 days of work. You don't get paid time off when you're an entrepreneur and I had no health coverage and I didn't have anyone to talk to. You can't when you've decided to keep things private. HIV can be really stressful too. In 2007, I became the afternoon drive host for a Toronto-based LGBTQ plus radio station you probably have heard of whose name I won't say. It is owned by a miserly, mean company, the very opposite of the kinds of places you guys come from, where obviously you care deeply, otherwise you wouldn't be at the summit. And I believe 2009 in December, I went into the drugstore to pick up my HIV meds. 
I was in such a good mood. It was my last week of shows. Then I was going to have two weeks off. And I was in the holiday spirit until I got my meds. $2,900, please, the clerk said. I figured there must be some sort of mistake. But then they told me I had no insurance to bill my meds to. But I did have insurance. I didn't have three grand extra to give to them. So I left without my life-saving medication. The next day, even though adherence to taking your meds is a must, I didn't have any to take. At the radio station, the person in charge had no idea why my meds didn't go through, and it took a day to find out. The radio station's owners had canceled everyone's health insurance without telling any of us, not giving us any warning at all in an effort to save money. I knew I couldn't be the only HIV positive person at the station. The stat back then was that one in four men who have sex with men in Toronto were HIV positive. I knew of one other guy who was. I found out another man there was when he came into the studio one afternoon crying because he didn't know what he's going to do about his, his medication. Nor did I. Going on Trillium was the fastest solution, but at that time, at least, it was a process that took weeks, if not a couple of months, and you can't stop your meds that long. I won't bore you with the details, but suffice to say, I didn't take any of this lying down and made the radio station cover the cost of my meds until I, I had coverage for them. I don't know what the other guys did. Call that a lesson in what not to do when dealing with employees with an episodic disability. In 2013, I decided to finally come out about my HIV status publicly. I was the chair of the 25th anniversary of the AIDS Walk for Life. I had spent the summer working on the walk and was shocked about the amount of stigma self-imposed and delivered by others, I still saw with other people who were HIV positive as well. It stunned and it saddened me. And I thought, well, I'm a happy guy. I'm doing well with no apologies to make. Maybe it would be helpful to others if I came out. I'm so sorry, I'm snotty. Inside the CBC radio studios that early Friday morning with then host Matt Galloway under the auspices of promoting the AIDS walk, I was an internal wreck, and I don't normally get nervous about things like this. Matt and I talked about the walk, and then he said, and I understand you have something else you want to say. I froze. It took everything I had not to bolt from my chair and out the studio door. For a flash in my mind, I actually considered it. My voice cracked as I began to say the words, I've never said before, I'm HIV positive. The relief I had was indescribable. And I went on to like an HIV and stigma to other ways in which we beat ourselves up and each other up, which we do simply for being human. I had sex with another person, unprotected sex, something totally human, something everyone who has had sex has had. And we beat ourselves up for being human, for getting too fat, for being too broke, for the marriage that ended in divorce. We find things to beat each other up with, ourselves up with as well, and it has to stop. Each of us is living an experience unique to us as we travel through life. And I know this for sure. Everyone, every one of us is doing the best they can with what they have. HIV took a big bite out of me three years ago. It was nearing Christmas 2020, and I had been feeling just awful. Sore, weak, no energy. I was having terrible trouble breathing, and it hurt so much to put weight on my left foot, I could barely walk. I'd spoken to my doctor, who thought I'd possibly had COVID, although I tested negative for COVID, and he thought maybe it was long COVID, and he told me to keep resting. A week later, I called him again, and I said, I'm a disaster. I remember telling him about my sore leg. I hadn't thought to tell him about that earlier. Later, he would tell me he literally jumped out of the chair, out of his chair. Get to emergency now. I remember him telling me, you have a blood clot. I did as I was told, and indeed he was right. A huge blood clot on my lung. Things were very tense. 75% of people who go into a hospital with a pulmonary embolism don't come back out. I'm blessed to be someone who did but it knocked me out. It took nearly two months of bed rest back at home, injecting my stomach with medicine every day, which took a toll on my life because I couldn't work. I would drag myself out of bed for commitments I had to keep, but then would crash immediately after. And that's not a good thing when you're an entrepreneur. No work was getting done. No money was being made. 
three years later, I still feel the effects of the pulmonary embolism. Scarring from the blood clot makes it so that my body isn't always giving en getting enough oxygen. And when that happens, I double over and I can't catch my breath. It's like I've run the longest race and then I run it again and then I run it again. And it, it happens in public. It's embarrassing when it happens in public. It happens doing everyday things. If I get out of a car, I can often be doubled over. Um, if I'm walking my dog and he's getting into it with another dog, pulling him away, that's he's 60 pounds. Um, that exertion causes this to happen. Climbing stairs without stopping midway to rest uh, causes this to happen. I'm so over it, I can't tell you. Unfortunately, no tests, and I've taken so many at this point, are helping any doctor ascertain how to treat this. Recently, I went to see a client who was on the second floor of his building and had an attack in front of him by the time I got to the top of his stairs. It's just not a cute look when trying to do business. Blessedly, I realized, recently spotted the opportunity to produce and host the Realize podcast, Nurturing Potential, Belonging, and Inclusion, and I got the job. There's been a learning curve stepping from entrepreneurship to working for this great nonprofit, but I'm amazed by the way in which Realize has turned knowledge into action. It runs through the veins of the organization. In the most authentic way I've ever experienced, the culture is one of mutual respect, support, consideration, compassion, understanding. The Realize staff is its own biggest cheerleader. I don't say this to you because I work there. I still feel like the new guy observing and drinking it all in. That's where I'm coming from. As that vantage point, I look and, I, and it's a place of astonishment that I come from. All while, and I said this at this recent staff meeting that I chaired, people I realize get a remarkable, remarkable amount of things accomplished. The depth and breadth of it all is incredible. And I believe in big part, it's because they turn knowledge into action. And so now here I am. Why have I shared this story? The one that's been so hard to tell. My long, nearly over 40 year story of my experience with HIV with you. Why have I put myself out there like this and done a sobby job of it? I've never shared before in such detail with anyone. I've shared though, because it contains so many of the themes the ingredients that many others who experience episodic disabilities know well. Things like fear, stigma, shame, loneliness, secrecy, and dealing with the disability itself. You are all empathetic people. You can use your imagination to get a strong idea of what my experience must have been like. You can feel what it must be like for those you work with who have episodic disabilities. I hope my detailed share helps you do that even more. Because it's also my hope that in putting yourself in the shoes of those people, that you don't just go back to your desk armed with knowledge, but go back to your desk and use your power and influence to make change so that your business thrives, so that you retain good people, you foster a sense of inclusion and belonging. I hope it's impossible for you not to do anything but turn knowledge you've gleaned at this fine summit into action. Ask yourself, what is the first step I can take tomorrow to nurture potential, belonging, and inclusion for all in my workplace? Ask yourself that right now. And tomorrow, take action and make your workplace thrive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you, everyone. We are for also you. happy that you made it through um, your most recent journey with the pulmonary embolism. We are also Thank you. happy that you made it through. Thank you. Thank you.